Yo, so I've been thinking about a way to kind of have like an episodic thing for me to keep track with the league over a recurring interval of time, and I came up with this idea, the League Wide Series. Why am I calling it League Wide? Well, I don't know, it just sounds cool. Basically over six days, I'm going to talk about all six divisions in the NBA, one division per day. I'm going to talk about their prior two weeks performance i'm going to project over their next two weeks and then we're going to reconvene about that division of teams two weeks later it's kind of hard to explain but you'll see it as it run as it runs its course so um yeah hopefully you guys enjoy today we're going to the northeast the atlantic divisions teams over the past two weeks, well, it was basically the start of the year for every team. So obviously the 76ers are the first in the Eastern Conference, so they've had the best start in the entire league. Though recently they've had some questionable losses, mainly the Denver one because they didn't really have most of their team. The Celtics started off the year kind of shaky, but they really hit their stride as of late putting them at second in the Eastern Conference. And opposite of that, the Nets really started out strong but really had some issues coming in later into their year. The Knicks have started out pretty well considering they're the Knicks. They've had a couple of surprising wins over some teams that you would assume would have definitely have the upper hand over them. They've gone on a couple of win streaks. And the Raptors have kind of been one of the more disappointing teams in the entire league. Here are the stats for the 76ers. Joel Embiid has basically been one of the players who I guess you could say is the MVP front runner um, starting the season. He's been a beast. I think this is the best we've seen Joel Embiid play in his entire career thus far. And the main thing that's standing out to me is his percentage from three. He's shooting 45.8% from three on three attempts per game. Now, it's not that high of a clip. It is an extremely high clip for a center, and especially a center that thrives on the inside scoring. But this clip is crazy. 45.8% from three. It's not sustainable, but I mean, it goes to show that Joel Embiid is focused this season. Ben's scoring is a way down than I thought it would be. I thought he'd be around the 17 range, but he's still scoring efficiently, and I think he's somebody who's in the Defensive Player of the Year race again to start the year. And Seth Curry's value on this team has been instrumental. I didn't see him coming in and averaging 17 points per game, but his shooting has been such a bright spot for the 76ers. We knew Seth Curry is one of the best shooters of all time percentage-wise, but even 59.5% from 3 on 5.3 attempts per game is insane. Some key team stats that stand out is obviously the second in defensive rating statistic. It's good to see that even with the 76ers losing Al Horford, who is one of the more multi-dimensional defensive bigs in our league, even with his old age, even with losing him, they were still able to retain their defensive prowess, obviously. And that's really what's carrying them to victory. Even with the addition of Seth Curry and Danny Green, their offense hasn't been the most beautiful thing in the world, but their defense is really carrying them at the moment. It's also good to see that the 76ers are running a bit more than last year. They're fifth in pace after being 20th in pace last year. And I think what's allowing them to get out and run in transition a bit is that they're being pretty disruptive on the defensive end. They're third in blocks per game. To start the season, obviously we're going to be looking at their revamped roster, the subtraction of Al Horford from the team entirely and adding great shooters on the wings and Danny Green and Steph, Steph Curry. Another big bright spot for the Sixers has been their bench scoring, Shake Milton putting up 14 points per game, relatively efficient from the field, Tyrese Maxey their first round pick around the 20 range, he's been able to provide scoring immediately which is definitely something the 76ers needed, some shot creation off the bench at their guard positions. The 76ers had a relatively easy schedule to start, so, we can, so we'll see if they can retain their success going forward in the season. The Celtics had a rough start of the year, but as of late, they've really come on the scene, and they've been carried by their two young ascending wings in Tatum and Jalen Brown. Tatum is picking up right where he left off at the end of last regular season and last postseason, still scoring a lot of points per game and at a high efficiency. Good percentage from the field and 43.8% from three on eight attempts per game. 
Jalen Brown though, nobody saw this coming. He is kind of keeping in stride with Tatum, averaging about the same points per game on better efficiency from field, but slightly lower efficiency from three, but it still is 42% from three on 5.7 attempts per game. And Marcus Smart is being Marcus Smart. He's not scoring the ball at great efficiency, but he's really been the best passer for this team and it's been needed, especially with Kemba Walker being out for the first couple of weeks of the season. With Kemba Walker being out, it's pretty impressive that the Celtics have been able to keep a top third offensive rating, but what is a bit disappointing is the fact their defensive rating is toward the bottom third. It's just disappointing because, you know, Brad Stevens coach teams are normally in the upper echelon of defenses. And problems on their defense are found in the amount of second chance points they're giving up, the amount of fast break points they're giving up, and their low defensive rebound percentage which was something that was supposed to be alleviated by them bringing in Tristan Thompson and them starting Daniel Tice and Tristan Thompson together. The main storylines this season are Tatum and Brown just really carrying the Boston Celtics offense and it's been needed, especially with Kemba Walker being out. Peyton Pritchard has been somebody who's been able to provide and produce right away, especially off the bench. This was an area of concern for Boston coming into the season. And Kemba Walker will be coming back soon, so this offense will be a lot more high power than it is already. The Knicks, the surprise of the start of the season. They've been led by Julius Randle, who's having a career year thus far. The shocking thing about him is his high assist rate, averaging 7.3 assists per game. He is turning the ball over quite a bit, around 4 or 5 turnovers a game, but he's the best playmaker on the team as of right now. RJ Barrett has been up and down throughout the year. This is shown in his efficiency. He still hasn't found that three-point shot. And Mitchell Robinson's actually been starting some games for Tom Thibodeau. I was afraid that he was going to start Nerland's Noel over Mitchell Robinson, but Thibodeau is giving the young buck his minutes and his starting time. So the key for the Knicks start of the season has been their defense because their offense has been one of the bottom offenses in the league according to offensive rating, but defensively they're fourth in defensive rating. And with bringing in a coach like Tom Thibodeau, who's had numerous years as a defensive assistant coach, and then when he became head coach, he hung his hat on defense. You knew he was going to come in and emphasize that with this young team, and it's shown his colors in the defensive rating statistics, and also in some other metrics as well. The Knicks give up the third most three-point attempts per game, so obviously they're making teams take shots from outside the arc the furthest away from the rim but they're also defending it at a great rate either they're defending it very well teams just aren't hitting them or it's a combination of both so shout out to tom thibodeau for getting a young a very young team one of the youngest teams in the league without the most defensive talent in the world outside of mitchell robinson to be, really be a great defensive team the major storylines here in New York is the fact that Julius Randle is apparently the greatest player of all time. He's playing out of his mind. RJ Barrett, he started off really well, but he's struggling. As of late, he's in a bit of a shooting slump. And the Knicks have gotten a lot of production from veterans like Alec Burks, who's been providing a lot of scoring off the bench. Austin Rivers, likewise, and Alfred Payton, who's been scoring pretty efficiently and he's had a decent three-point shot, at least compared to the rest of his career. The Nets season has been very up and down, mainly because of situations off the court. Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving are still doing their thing. They are two of the most efficient scorers in the entire league right now. Karis LeVert is a front runner for sixth man of the year because of his production. And Jared Allen has improved again as the starting center for this Brooklyn Nets team. When everybody's been healthy and when everybody's been in the lineup, the Nets look virtually unbeatable. They have a great offensive rating and a great defensive rating. I thought the offensive rating would be a lot better than the, the defensive one, but defensively this team looks even better than it does offensively. I think we have to credit Steve Nash and the rest of the coaching staff for that. And their prowess on defense is also allowing their offense to be a lot better because they're getting points off of turnovers and they're getting some points in the fast break. So that just allows offense to come a lot easier. And that's something that's already going to help a team with two lethal offensive shot creators in Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant. Honestly, the major storylines here are just the absences of both of their superstars. Kyrie has been absent due to personal reasons. I assume they're related to the events that took place in Washington. Um, the only question I have here is 
So will this be something that affects the locker room? Maybe this whole preferential treatment thing, similar to what happened with the Clippers last year. And the Nets have been really struggling recently. Uh, there have been games where Kyrie and KD both play that they lost, but then most of the recent games, either one star has been in and the other has been out or both stars just haven't been playing. So that could be the reason for their struggles. Going forward with both of them coming back into the lineup, we assume sometime soon, um, I think they'll be okay. And lastly, we have the Raptors, who have been one of the more disappointing teams to start the season. Pascal Siakam has been pretty disappointing. He's somebody who's supposed to be their franchise player. Those are the expectations that basically Masai Ujiri has put on him, but he just hasn't been that thus far. He's not shooting the ball well at all. Fred Van Fleet is actually really living up to his contract. He's playing pretty well, scoring a bit, a lot more efficiently than he did last year. Kyle Lowry is doing basically the same thing he did last year, so it's a good sign that he's not regressing. And OG Ananobi is basically doing the same thing he did last year, but I think the Raptors want a bit more out of him, given that he's their main, like, young ascending player. The Raptors just really look disjointed. Their offensive and defensive rating stats are not great, but really they're just getting killed because of their big man rotation. They're not rebounding very well. They are 28th in defensive rebound percentage. They're giving up way too many second chance points and they're fouling an extreme amount of times. They're giving up the third most free throw attempts per game. I don't know how much this has to do with basically playing no home games since they're playing in Tampa Bay for all of their home games. Um, their big man position, maybe losing Gasol and Ibaka was bigger than we all imagined it would be. So maybe this suggests that they're going to have to go to a small ball lineup with where OG Ananobi is running center. Kind of similar to the lineup they ran against the Celtics in the playoffs. A lot of it lies on Pascal's shoulders. He simply has to be better. I guess a bright spot for them has been Chris Boucher, who's averaging 13.5 points per game. 2.1 blocks on 40% from three in 20.8 minutes per game. So he's been a really bright spot, somebody who can bring in shooting, uh, rim protecting, and some energy off the bench. Here's the schedule over the next two weeks for all these teams. Some things that stand out to me is that the 76ers schedule still looks relatively easy. They're playing an Atlanta team who has some locker room issues. Miami still hasn't figured it out yet. I don't know if Jaw's going to be back for this Memphis game. Okay, C's probably the worst team in the league. Their main test is Boston when they play them twice, a divisional rivalry, and then they wrap it up with Detroit, another lottery bound team. So I think they still have the easiest schedule out of all the Atlantic teams. And I think the team with the hardest schedule is the Brooklyn Nets. They're playing the Denver Nuggets who are getting back into their stride. New York isn't the typical New York team that we've seen over the past five years. Orlando's been very surprising there amongst the top teams in the East. Milwaukee is going to start figuring it out. Cleveland's been very surprising in the Eastern Conference. And Miami is struggling a bit, but they still are the team that's defending the Eastern crown. Over these next two weeks, I expect the 76ers and the Celtics to be pretty successful. I think the Raptors will kind of get back into their stride and go above 500. Given Brooklyn's tough schedule and the fact that we don't know when Kyrie Irving will be back, I think they'll only go above 500 over the next two weeks. For the Knicks, I think they have a relatively tough schedule and I think they'll kind of slide over the next two weeks. Over the past couple years, the Atlantic division has been pretty top heavy, with teams like Philly, Boston, and Toronto perennially being Eastern Conference contenders. But now this year, with Brooklyn virtually bringing in two superstars to launch them into title contention, and with the Knicks continuing to shock the world, I think we can say that the Atlantic division is the most talented division in the league top to bottom. Chill, 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 chill.